Hey everyone, Raylan here. I could not possibly be more excited about this interview that is coming up right now. Now, I know I say that I'm excited a lot, and I always am, but this time I am like pretty over the top excited because I have been wanting to interview Ryan Rose Evans for a very long time. He is just so respected and so influential in the health community. And I just, I'm like, I didn't even know if he would say yes if I asked him. And I'm just so honored that he did. So Ryan has had his own health journey leading up to where he is now. He was never formally diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, but he did face a period of time after extreme exercising and bodybuilding that he went through a sort of crash, an adrenal crash, and was going through chronic fatigue. And he has come through that, and he has learned so much, and he is trained in many ways. He's a nutritionist, he's a health coach, he's many, many different wonderful things, and he works with people all over the world, helping them to restore their health and happiness. So although Ryan is originally from London, England, he now resides in the south coast of Australia. And in this chat, we go through a whole bunch of questions that people posed on social media. So I put the word out that I was going to be interviewing Ryan. Very excited. And people came back with a whole lot of questions that they wanted to ask him. So in this one, we go through a ton. And I know this is a long interview, but it is time stamped. So feel free to jump around to the parts that interest you. And I am just really looking forward to hearing what you think. So let's, uh, let's jump right in. Ryan, so excited to be having this chat with you today. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Mm, absolute pleasure. Uh, I love your work. I love your YouTube channel. Um, I've been watching it for a while and uh, we've had our chat on my Instagram. I'm just, yeah, I love it. I love what you do and what you put out there. So I appreciate you for having me on board. That means a lot coming from you because I have a ton of respect for what you do. I know you have just, you know, a lot of people out there who love you and follow you what you what you do and a really big social media following. So, yeah, yeah, it's really an honor to have you. So before you know, we have, a, we have quite a few questions, uh, an ambitious list of questions to cover today. When we threw it out there, people had a lot they wanted to ask you, which is great. Um, but before we dive into that, for people who are watching that might not be familiar with you or the work that you do, can you just give us, you know, a, a bit of your background and what brought you to this point where you're working on, you know, supporting people with their health and their happiness? Mm, great question. I will try my best to try and simplify it. Um, so uh, I'm a guy that had um, a struggled upbringing in, to some degree, lived in a very rough area in London, um, lots of trauma around the area that I grew up in. Um, this took me then into my later life to build up a big shell around me. So I was really into bodybuilding. I needed to be the um, strongest and biggest in the room to be able to protect myself later in life. Throughout my years with lots of um, drug abuse, addiction and trauma that was unresolved, um, I started to get really unwell. Um, I came off the drugs, I came off everything that was making me feel unhealthy, changed my food and my diet, and then I struggled really bad with um, fatigue. Um, I don't know if you'd put me in the category, what spectrum you'd put me in regards to maybe CFS, but I really believe it was my adrenals and my body just saying to me, you just need to just stop for a second because I was just struggling with it. Throughout that sort of path and throughout that journey and throughout withdrawing of pharmaceuticals and drugs that I was doing, I had to start to find ways of healing myself. Now, like everyone else, I started with diet and nutrition and some of those aspects and that really massively helped and then as I went through into my studies my background is in dietetics and I studied microbiology I'm now studying psychotherapy um, throughout my study and my learnings I started to really uncover the pieces of the human experience and human body mind body emotion connection spiritual everything really and started to really unpeel those. And that's really sort of how I help people now is help them to uncover their own uh, self-healing capabilities and help them navigate some of the uncomfortableness that they're going through at that moment in time. Hey, that was a really long-winded answer. Oh, it I wasn't at all. <laughs> 
Not even a little bit. That's, it's really tough, isn't it, to sum up a journey like that in just a few minutes because there's so much, even when you're just trying to give a quick summary, it's, it's, it's a lot to cover. Yeah, it's really, I really love watching the work that you do with people when I follow you online and the things that you post on social media because I feel that you post with um, more honesty and humbleness and truthfulness or just a very large amount of these things, which is something that is challenging to do, I think, in a social media space. So I just, when I read your posts, I, I'm very moved and I find them very insightful and I'm very appreciative because I think it's very validating for all of us when other people out there are that honest about the struggles that they've been through. And we've all had struggles. So, you know, mm -hmm. pretending that we haven't. So anyways, yes, um, I'm very grateful that you've made so much progress in your journey and you're at this amazing place that you are now and that you're sharing so much of this with other people. Mm, so I appreciate I, that. Thank you. I mean, um, most of the people that uh, watch these videos are facing chronic fatigue syndrome or ME or someone they care about is, and many of them have lost some or most of them lost all of their ability to exercise. And many people, mm. at least what I found in talking to people who face ME-CFS are kind of those overachiever types. Like there's a lot of athletes and extreme athletes and runners and people who worked out religiously. So to have that taken away can be very jarring. And with your history with working out and, you know, the, the relationship you had with that and your appearance and how that impacted your mental health, you know, some questions came up around that. So like Andre asked, mm. you know, you know, do you have any tips or suggestions on how to overcome, you know, body issues or find your self worth from causes other than your body? Mm, great question. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I guess for me personally, um, I can only talk from my own experience and what I did. Um, starting to uncover self worth, self love, and gratitude for myself and what it does and what my body does for it on a daily basis is still an ongoing long um, journey that I start to have to keep unpeeling from time to time, especially from coming from a bodybuilding background where you're being critiqued on your um, physique all of the time. You know, um, It's a path that is a struggle, but once I started to um, uh, really unpeel my not looking the same way anymore not feeling that i once i'd actually dropped how i looked and started to my physique started to change and i started to really concentrate on how i felt about myself when i looked in the mirror one step at a time and realizing that i don't need to stand in front of the mirror saying i love myself I don't know if you're anything like me, but if you stand in the mirror and tell yourself, I love myself, that inner critic can come in and go, no, you don't. You don't really <laughs> love yourself. So uh, what I tend to normally say to myself is, I'm learning to love myself. I'm learning mm. to love every part of me. I'm learning to be grateful for all of the things that it does for me. It's still a struggle from, from you know, some days, you know, still when I know, when I'm fully healed about my body image, it was when I go to the beach and take my clothes off and I don't feel like I have to hide parts of my body. You know? And the older I'm getting and the more work I do, the more I'm able to be more comfortable in my own skin. I wouldn't be able to say there's a few tips on how we can start to do that because it's so really delves deep into our trauma and where we sort of, what sort of mm -hmm. family and upbringing and social media use we come from um, to be able to really delve into that. Yeah, it's tough. We're bombarded with so much. It's um, it's really understandable that you know that many pe people, regardless of their level of health, are facing some kind of body issues. And I like your point about saying standing in front of the mirror and saying I love myself. I have tried that, and you're right. There's a part of me in my head that's like, you're lying. <laughs> yeah. But one thing one thing I have found that helps if I stand in the mirror and I look at myself, and I instead I say. I accept myself exactly as I am. And I look at the parts mm. of myself that I don't typically love, but accept feels more doable. Like, okay, I don't have to love these things. I don't have to think everything on my body is perfect, but it is something I found really powerful just to, just to say those words, I accept myself exactly how I, how I am. And yeah. Mm, completely. I love that. 
And I think the big thing that comes to it depends on our upbringing and our responses and our caregivers depend on how critical that they were on themselves and how they dealt with things depends on how we're going to later in life. And I'm a big fan of knowing what trauma response you are in to knowing how you're going to show up in life. I don't know if you may have seen my post on the fight, flight, freeze, fawn responses and knowing which one you are, and which one you sort of you sort of resonate with the most, which I can go into more detail about later if you like. Yeah, actually, that would be great. Now I have seen some of that, but I, I'd love to hear more. And I imagine some people watching aren't familiar with it. So if you could share a little bit, that would be great. Yeah, sure. I mean, everyone's heard of fight, flight, right? Fight, flight, and even freeze. And some, most of the ones that people aren't really um, heard of is flop and fawn. Now, Fawn types are the people pleasers of the world. They're codependent in codependent relationships. They've normally had relationships with narcissists. Uh, it's very common. Uh, they have a hard time standing up for themselves. They have a hard time standing, saying no, setting boundaries. Uh, they like to avoid conflicts. They defer to others to make decisions. You know, they're concerned with fitting in. They need to be liked by everyone. So knowing if you resonate with some of those and knowing that you're a fawn type and that when you're in a trauma response, knowing that you're fawning really gives you some insight into what triggers are being presented to you. So, for example, if someone speaks to you in a certain way and you go to people, please, and you apologize a lot or you say sorry a lot, this gives you an inclination that that's a trigger for you. Mm. So sometimes people don't know that they've had a trigger. Sometimes they don't know they're even being triggered. They just go into this um, conditions, trauma response that they've learned from childhood into one of these types of responses, fight, flight, etc. Flight types, for example, which was me for a very long period of my life, is feelings of panic and anxiety, workaholics, perfectionist, overachievers, uh, analytical, hyperactive, always on the go, always busy, always doing, you know always exercising, always non-stop, you know, my adrenals were just burnt out from that. Mm -hmm. Over worrying, up in the brain a lot, over analyzing, you know. Um, and then you've got the fight types, which are more like the temper, angry outbursts. Um, they have more narcissistic tendencies, fight types, in them. They dominate and control others, they pursue power, they are, can be very charming, be sort of very charming like a charming bully at the same time be very criticizing rage a lot have problems with anger issues etc um yeah that's fight type really and um, they're the more the aggressive types and they are normally in relationships with fawn types and fawn types are normally attracted to fight types so it's uh it's funny that these sort of things, you see this very often. I see this often in clinic when I'm working with people. Um, how fawns are attracted to the fight types of the world. And they normally see themselves in relationships with those type of people. Um, then you have freeze types, which are more depressed, disassociated. They have ADD, ADHD type symptoms. They like to spend their time hibernating. Um, they just dis disassociate brain fog a lot of the time. They avoid human contact and detach from the outside world and will stay indoors and isolate and stay away from everyone else. Now, the good thing to know with all of these types, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, is that we can be all of them at once. We can be a hybrid of all of them and we can change throughout our life as we uh, progress in our journey. We can, uh, you know, we can be a fawn type and then we can end up being a flight. We can go to these different responses more and more. And I find that a really powerful tool to knowing where you sit and where you are and where you what and then what sort of response and what trauma response you are. What a great explanation. I, I think because we like to think of a lot of these things like, you know, how do I deal with my body image issues or you know, how do I deal with different things like this in our lives? But it sounds like it's not always so simple as just here are the three strategies that work for everybody. It really has a lot to do with, you know, where that's coming from, how you're operating at the moment, how your mindset is, and so forth. So 
Yeah, I found that really interesting. Thank you for sharing all of that. No, that's all right. No worries. Um, I have so many things. I've we've got so many questions here and <laughs> I have to hold myself back from asking 10 follow-up questions for each because I would keep you here <laughs> all day. Um, but so yes, reluctantly moving on, but I'm glad somebody asked about this because I've seen this, um, watch following you online and you're doing these ice baths with people. And I've seen videos that looks like people getting into a giant deep freeze with ice and water. And, uh, mm. so Anne specifically asked about this, about the benefits of the ice baths that you do. Like, what's that about? And, and what, what are people mm. getting from that? Mm. Um, I'm a big fan of cold therapy, heat therapy, um, for many reasons. Um, I think we spend our lives being very comfortable. And I think my part of my journey, I've really started to learn that being comfortable with being uncomfortable really helped me through the very difficult times in my life. And throughout my journey at the very start, I started to come across Wim Hof and his cold therapy mm. and his breath work and how that, was, uh, the, how that does so much healing properties and on the physiological changes of the body. Um, you know, how it blunts inflammation, how people that have had severe um, uh, depression have come out of their depression from getting into the cold. And now, not that I would recommend anyone doing this that has adrenal issues or chronic fatigue or anything. Um, for me personally, where I'm at now, um, it's very healing. Um, we do a, I do a once a week uh, group breath work ice bath session which is all about getting the lymphatic system moving, getting the body moving, getting into the body, doing a bit of dance, a bit of breath work, a bit of meditation, um, respecting the ice, respecting the cold, and slowly getting into the cold and letting it do its wonders on the body. Now, what is it doing on the body? Like I said, it reduces inflammation. It literally blunts inflammation. Um, it gets into uh, the fat tissue around the organs, so we can actually see in studies that it breaks away um, fatty tissue and brown fat tissue around the organs like the liver and the kidneys and heart. It gets to those places that we can't really get to with pushing ourselves into a deficit or moving with um, uh, over over moving the, the body with exercise, etc. So this is a really good way of being able to let the body do what it naturally needs to do, breathe in the uncomfort and really um, sit in the cold, really. That is fascinating. Um, so, uh, some of that I, I had read about and heard about before, but some of that was brand new. And I, I've been a fan of, because I've been doing you know hot and cold showers for a few years now. So every day I shower and I blast myself for a couple of minutes with the cold. And I've been doing it, I originally started it to support my lymphatic system. I just noticed that it helped me to recover from things more quickly. And then I would feel better if I was feeling unwell. But the more people I talk to, like yourself, the more I'm learning that it has so many more benefits beyond that. So yeah, that's that's really interesting. Mm, completely. Uh, I'm a big fan of the uh, overstimulating the lymphatic system. So <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, the hot and cold is perfect for that. Yeah. So we have some questions around diet and gut health as well, because I know you have you do a lot of work with that. So Andre, Peter, Catherine and Hazen uh, asked about just if you could share a bit on diet and gut health. So any recommendations on how to have a healthy microbiome or do you have any specific diet recommendations for people who are trying to be healthier? Mm, um, I guess that's a really loaded question in regards to what would be beneficial to someone's microbiome because we're all different. We're over, our yeah. microbiome is a fingerprint of us. We all have different paths, different antibiotic usage, medication usage, different um, experiences and environments that we live in and exposure to toxins. So I guess when I first work with a client, most of the people that come to me have chronic conditions going on. And the first thing I'll do is I'd like to test. If you don't test, you guess. And I'd like to find out what's going on in their, in their stool, in their microbiome. So I'd like to find out with a stool test, see how they are, see how it's mm. flourishing, and see what their microbiome diversity is. I'd say pretty much 70% to 80% of the people I work with have fungal overgrowth from years of antibiotic usage. Some have parasites, and most of them have some form of a dysbiotic gut 
Now, all I mean by dysbiosis is an imbalance of gut bacteria. Mm. Um, I'm 34 years old and I was brought up when I was ill, I would go to the doctors and I would be given medication and I would be given uh, antibiotics. And I was I lived like that for many years, you know, um, which then caused a big problem on my gut microbiome and its diversity, as well as my liver and my bile that my liver is attached to. So it caused a lot of problems. Then you have stomach acid issues and constipation, bloating, and then the link between mental health and your gut microbiome is is huge. So firstly, finding out how your microbiome, what sort of state it is in, is a really good place to start. And then I say the biggest focus in regards to most people with diet is fiber. I'm a big fan of fiber and making sure we're getting, you know, six to nine cups of uh, vegetables a day and preferably from good sources, not stuff that's had pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, glyphosate all sprayed on them, you know, so having trying to get organic or um, as best sourced as possible. Now, for those people that can't afford um, uh, organic, which sometimes uh, there was a point in my life I couldn't afford organic foods, and I was like, well, I want to not have all these pesticides and herbicides exposure, mm. so what can I do? So there's a list called the Dirty Dozen um, online. The Dirty Dozen and the Clean and 15. And the Dirty Dozen gives you a list of all of the most highly sprayed um, uh, veggies and what's sprayed on spinach, apples, strawberries. Mm. They're mostly highly sprayed. So you can just avoid those ones and try and get those from farmer's markets or organic as best as you can. Then the other list you've got is the Clean and 15, which are the ones that you don't necessarily need to spend your money on getting organic, like avocados, coconuts, things that have more of a skin on. Um, so you don't need to spend $7 on an organic uh, avocado, <laughs> you know. Um, so making sure that your choices of the fiber that you are consuming or the food that you are consuming is of good quality. Because if you are consuming things with herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, uh, mm. or meats that has antibiotics and hormones given to it, your gut's got to digest that. And that's more toxicity that it's got to deal with at the same time. So we really want to make sure that the produce of the food and the fiber that we are consuming. Uh, the big question I get a lot of the time about gut health is, oh, uh, meat eating, carnivore, plant-based, mm. which is the best for me? I would answer that everyone is different. Um, my, which is, I know is a very annoying answer for people, but um, I'll give you from my own personal experience. I've tried many other ways when I was healing my gut. I had a terrible, uh, terrible gut, which took me down the path of learning what I did, and studying what I did. And I tried carnivore, plant-based and all of these different things. And I didn't feel that they all had their pros and their cons. Mm. I tended to have a mixture. I'm a bit of a hybrid. So I will eat meat, um, but I will eat meat every now and then. Um, and I will eat good quality meat. But most of the time, my meals will be plant-based and with lots and lots of fiber in. I will still consume fish. So I wouldn't put myself into a category of um, vegan or plant-based or mm -hmm. carnivore. Or I'm just a mixture of all of it. And I try to listen to my body intuitively and see what it needs and go from there. I can go on and on and on. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I know in my mind's just to go on. I have like 18 other questions and, and thoughts around this. But yeah, I think yeah. that was really well said. And it, I, I found it interesting when you said it's kind of an annoying answer because yes, you know, often we want to hear something specific, do this. But then also yeah, it's slightly annoying when people are saying you must be vegan or you must be carnivore and this works for everybody because I think most of us appreciate that that's not the case. And the, the other thing I pull out of that, and from just from my own experience and what I see in talking to people is that I think a lot of us, myself included, want to fit into some kind of box. It just mm. feels good to be like, I'm a vegan or I'm paleo or I'm a carnivore or whatever it is. And mm. people are more comfortable with us too when we can give some sort of label to where we are. And, you know, my husband and I went over to 100% vegan for a while. And then we started to realize, it sounds like, um, you know, we settled somewhere around like you did. We're still strongly plant-based, but we do eat meat on occasion. And it was, it's it confuses people. You know, they want to know like, what are you? <laughs> mm, there's, there's no really label. Yeah, it's just, it's just a bit of everything. Yeah. 
Completely. And the people that struggle with meat uh, and struggle with being able to digest meat can, uh, mm. a lot of the time is most of the time because they've had a lot of antibiotic usage, which means their liver is sluggish, which means their enzymes aren't being produced for their stomach acidity. So it means that when they eat meat, they feel very sluggish or they're eating mm. really bad quality, inhumane sort of kept meat, you know. So for me, morally, uh, I don't like to eat a lot of meat. So mm. I only eat sparingly. But I'm more of a let's find out the root cause of why you're feeling like this rather than let's just not disband, never eating this again or only mm -hmm. ever eating in this category because I think that really pigeonholes you to your healing and your all the other emotions come with it, guilt and stuff. Yeah, I think the stress of trying to st be too rigid with things can be way worse. You can undo all the good that you're trying to oh, do with whatever healthy completely. diet. <laughs> completely. I remember being at a phase in my healing journey where I was convinced that pretty much everything except for organic kale that was locally grown was going to kill me. Like I just, everything I read told me that there was something wrong with every food out there. Like this was, I had to be the most yeah. annoying person to be around because I could tell you why every food was bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> didn't matter what it yeah. was I and mean, you can just you can make yourself crazy it's it's yeah not a good I, can, I completely get you i've been there and I, <laughs> you know, I complete, i'm you know i was there not that long ago you know so yeah all right so we have uh you talked about you know having a past history with uh addictions and so we have a question from kim who talked about dealing with addic addictions which is something i actually mm. hear about a lot in the MECFS community. And I think it's understandable because a lot of us do some self-soothing or some self-medicating and it's just a challenging time where you can be in the middle of hell and also trying to overcome any addictions you might be facing. So any insights from your own experience or the people that you work with on this? Mm. Um, I love talking about addiction because it's something that was ingrained in my life from a very young age, you know, and it's, um, I think a lot of the time people think of addiction as people that are drug addicts or alcoholics, mm. um, which doesn't necessarily mean that that's addiction. It can be addiction to food, to sex, to porn, mm. to buying, shopping, to our health, um, to doing inner work and shadow work. You can be addicted to anything that gives a dopamine release. And I think Gabal Mate um, is the one that um, I've learned from the most through doing his courses and working under him was there is no one with that's had um, trauma that not all people that have had trauma I try not to butcher the quote not all people that have had trauma um, end up with uh, addicts but everyone that is an addict has had trauma okay and that really hmm. tells us there's a really powerful um, aspect that most people that have had addict and most people that are addicts are definitely had some trauma in their life um, at some point but not everyone that's had some form of trauma ends up an addict in some way so it's that form of being able to regulate the nervous system to be able to like you said um, self-soothe uh, even self-validate you know whatever that may be whatever your addiction is and I really believe that as you go through the addictions like I went well, I was uh, heavily into drugs and pharmaceuticals and self-soothing myself with drink and porn and all these other aspects. Once I started to come off of those and uh, unlayer them, other ones popped up. So then it would be food or then it would be health or then it would be porn or sex or whatever it may be. You know, it was kept unraveling and it never, uh, uh, it never, phased until I started to work on the root cause of the trauma and where that came from and why I was self-soothing and working on those abandonment wounds and understanding that sort of side of things. I think that's really helpful and really validating to hear because I suspect that a lot of people, we when we look at our addictions, we instead look at it as some sort of personal weakness or some sort of failure or fault in our character. You know, why can't I stick to my plans? We make these promises. I'm not going to do this anymore. And then we keep doing it. And it just feels, feels like failure. It feels like there's something wrong with us, but it's just, it sounds like from what you're saying, it's a symptom. It's actually not in itself, even the problem. It's, it's a symptom mm -hmm. of something else. So you gotta, gotta go deeper. That was, yeah, it was really well said. I, I believe that more than anything. I've never seen anyone that I've worked yeah. with that has um, addictive, um, they say there's an addictive gene um, 
that I say a lot of the time, which uh, as the re- I, I would uh, I, I I do take a lot of my work from Gabor Mate because mm-hmm. he's an addictive addiction specialist. I'm not an addiction specialist, so I don't want to you know, and I also don't want to overquote him. But he does talk about the fact that the gene, sometimes this addictive gene, is sometimes a way for people to be able to put the blame onto something else. When um, a lot of parents like to say, oh, there's an addictive gene, this is why there's an addictive process, rather than maybe there is trauma that's caused um, the child or whatever it may be to go into that. It doesn't mean that the caregivers are to blame. It could be they've the person's had a, a bad experience from bullying at school or they've had an emotional problem with their partner. It can be anything. So really trying to find out the root cause of what are you self soothing from? What is it that you're what is it that you're feeling just before you do that addictive process? So before I would eat all the food or drink all the alcohol or whatever the addictive process may be, I would just stop for a brief second, even before I was going to do it. Say I had an emotional food addiction problem. Before I decided to eat the sweets, whatever it may be, I just need to stop for a brief second and just go, what is it I'm not feeling right now? What is it I'm not wanting to feel? What's going on in my body? How can I check in with myself right now to be able to go, ah, Okay, that's what it is. And then even if I decide to eat the sweets, at least I've given myself that point of awareness to go, mm. okay, that's what it is. And then over time, that awareness will build. And then you can start to go longer periods of time on the spectrum of being able to feel the emotion all the way through its feeling and through the sensations of the body until it goes, until you don't need to use the addictive source that you're using to go through. It's a very long road. I... Okay. I love that, though. I think that is a, such a great insight in that I also think a lot of us feel that we it's something that we're just going to get over in a day or a week, but it is a process for most of us. It's not like maybe for some of us, one day a light bulb goes off and we're just good. But, you know, as you're having those moments, just use them to learn from them and not judge yourself for it. Just, you know, kind of step back and be like, okay, what's happening here? What am I feeling? And I can see how over time you would get you know, more and more insight to why that's happening and um, maybe better, better able to, to, to manage it or to, to find healthier things to do. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for that. Absolutely. I guess uh, for anyone asking, so uh, anyone asking about the addictive, uh, about the addiction, um, what can they do? Um, just some, a tool for someone that can do is firstly, be aware of what you're, you feel that you, you can't go without, be that sugar, be that sweets, be that food, be that porn, whatever it may be shopping love to buy and shop things whatever it is Mm -hmm. um just write them all down what you think those things are without trying to judge yourself on those things and the next time you notice yourself in that process um firstly give yourself a pat on the back that you've noticed yourself in the process secondly the next time you go to do that process again go is there anything going on is there anything that i'm trying to avoid right now is there an emotion that i'm trying to that I've been triggered from? Is there a person that has said something to me in a certain way that has reminded me of something that I can just maybe step in beforehand? That's just something that massively helps helped me that I thought someone could go away with uh, to work on some of those things. And obviously lots of therapy as well, massively helped me. <laughs> well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, we had, oh, a question from Sergio. He wanted to know what your daily routine looks like and what can you absolutely not go without? Oh, my, uh, I call it my um, non-negotiables. So my non-negotiables for the mood, for the day, I've literally written them up in, on my board in front of me. So I have a, uh, I'll take it down so I can show you. <laughs> Uh, I have a commitment to self routine. So it's the commitment I make to myself and I split this up into different categories. So for those that maybe not be able to see that, but it's morning, health, self care and night. So I split them up. And obviously this is a very, it seems like a very long list, but they're very small, simple things that I tend to do. Mm-hmm. Um, first thing I do in the morning when I wake up is a hydrate. I have a big one litre mason jar uh, glass next to my bed and I have some minerals in it, maybe some Celtic sea salt, maybe some trace minerals, 
um, to have as soon as I wake up in the morning after being asleep for seven, eight, nine hours. Um, the body is massively dehydrated. The lymphatic system is massively sluggish. So I'll have that first liter of water and then I will do a lymphatic massage um, first thing in the morning, which is a little concoction that I've made of castor oil, tea tree, coconut oil. I keep it in a big jar and I just sort of mix it in together once a week. And I do a lymphatic massage um, starting from the low pressure points all the way down through the body. Um, which if anyone's interested in learning what that big six mass uh, is uh, on my page, there's a, a chat that I did with Dr. Perry Nicholson, who's uh, Stop Chasing Pain. He's the lymphatic doc who I learned that from. And he goes through the big six uh, lymphatic massage if anyone was interested in knowing what that was. So hydration, lymphatic massage. Uh, then I do some sort of movement. So I'm a big fan of doing the Tibetan rites. Um, and this was a big thing for me when I was struggling with chronic fatigue, um, was giving myself a baseline of doing something small. Um, you can, you know, there's rep ranges with the Tibetan rites from one rep all the way up to 21 reps. Now, when I first started doing them, I would go into a regression and struggle with fatigue after doing just one rep of each of those. Mm. So I just would do them one every other day or one every few days and not be hard on myself and try and slowly pick up the Tibetan rites. So the Tibetan rites are five postures. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're five postures that are, that are known for longevity and all about getting the energy flow of the body and getting the chakras spinning. If you want to go into the spiritual side of things, um, some sort of stretching sort of, sort of movement. And I like to do a bit of Qigong as well. That's, Sounds really long-winded, but some of that will only take 15 to 20 minutes, you know. And I make sure I wake up a little bit earlier to do that. Um, I will sit in some form of meditation. Sometimes I don't even like to say that I meditate. I just like to sit in quiet with myself without any distractions. Picking up the water, doing stretching, looking at my phone, looking at emails. I just like to sit in some type of silence and note it, check in with myself and see how my body's going and see what's going on in my mind and where I'm at for the day. And then I like to ground, get in the sun, and like to like to ground, ground the body. Um, we know the benefits of grounding. I'm a big fan of Clint Ober's work um, on earthing. Uh, big recommendation there if you want to look into that stuff. I know you're, you're big on grounding as well. Um, but yeah, getting outside and grounding my feet into the earth and my hands into the earth and just having a little brief walk outside into nature. I'm very lucky to live by the sea. So sometimes I'll just walk down to the beach, put my feet in the sea and that will be that. Um, but sometimes I don't get through all of those. So sometimes I will literally just do the, the ones that are non-negotiable for me are the lymphatic massage, the hydration and um, some form of movement. Mm. So move, hydrate, and lymphatic uh, are the big, big, big aspects of our health. I love that. What a great routine. And I'm like, why don't I have one of these boards? I know tomorrow I'm going to be making one and putting it on my wall. <laughs> That's such a great idea. Just to keep your focus, too, and remind yourself of, of what you want to be doing every day. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, another question about self-care. Catherine asked about sleep hygiene. Oh, this is such a massive one. With people with ME-CFS seem to struggle so much with sleep. So yeah, any any thoughts or insights on, on things that help with sleep? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I've written a book on sleep hygiene. Um, so for anyone that's interested in getting that, you're more than welcome to shoot me over a message and I'll send you a free ebook copy for it. Um, no problem at all. And through that, I just go through um, what basically why important of our skating and our circadian rhythm is and how we can start to optimize our sleep and our sleep hygiene. I'd probably say the most important part of sleep hygiene is actually how you start your day, is getting some form of sunlight first thing in the mm -hmm. morning to kickstart your circadian rhythm. Um, our body needs light. We are basically like that meme on Instagram. We are like houseplants. We need to be uh, watered and put in the sunlight um, to be healthy, right? So getting outside in the sun is really important. And then as the sun goes down, starting to wind the body down. 
So as we start to wind the body down, it's uh, more of a yin flow type part to our day. So we really want to start to calm the nervous system down. If you're watching TV, watch things that make you laugh, that make you smile, read books that make you smile, not personal development, and especially not any self-help <laughs> books. Try to just read a novel that you like and you enjoy and that you can escape from. Put on some blue blocking glasses, some blue and green spectrum blocking glasses is probably the biggest prescription for your sleep that I could recommend is making sure you get a full spectrum of blue blocking glasses um, just to make sure you're we are exposed to so much blue light from light bulbs above us to screens mm -hmm. to phones to uh, even just small led standby lights we're constantly being exposed to them which disrupts our circadian rhythm stops us producing melatonin stops our body's ability to detox and our body's ability to fully rest. For people that go, oh, I don't watch TV in the night, or I don't look at my screen, even going to the toilet in the middle of the night and flicking the light bulb on while you're going to the toilet will disrupt your circadian rhythm. Your body will think, oh, the sun's up, it's daylight. So I'm going to um, I'm going to start waking the body up, produce the hormones I need to wake the body up. Mm -hmm. And cortisol starts running through the body to get you going. Now, when as soon as you put those blue blocking glasses on, you can just really... Uh, your body's melatonin production starts to kick in and really start to do its job. So as soon as your head hits a pillow, you go into a deeper sleep straight away. Um, what else have I put here? I lock my phone away and my laptop uh, at 8.30 o'clock, at 8.30 every night. That's a big thing. Um, I do some form of yoga or somatic floor work or psoas release. Now, what I mean by that is I do like a yin-style yoga flow, something that's calming for the body. And somatic floor work is um, basically just moving around on the floor and letting my body do what it needs to do. Might put some music on, some calming music, and just let my body stretch and move and roll around and stretch around, whatever it needs to do. If it needs to shake or I need to get any sort of trauma out the body, I will just make sure I do some sort of involuntary um, shaking. Um, I will sit, meditate, I will journal, and I will read at least five pages of a book. So I try not to say I'm going to read a chapter or I'm going to do this. I just read five pages. And uh, I found that really helpful for me for my night routine. Another long-winded answer. Oh, it was a great <laughs> one. You hit so many big ones there. I've struggled with sleep my whole life. And I do virtually all of those things that you've said. And they have helped me tremendously. I used to think that I was mm. just sort of broken or there was something biologically wrong with me that I couldn't sleep. But it is incredible how much these things can help. And I know it can be overwhelming to make, if you're not doing all these things, to make all these changes at once, but just do what you can, you know, pick one thing, change that, then, you know, try something else, add that in. No, I think that's great. Yeah, thanks for that. Completely, completely. I would say the one thing for anyone is get yourself some blue blocking glasses, especially right. for the exposure for light. And I'm a big fan of mouth taping whilst you sleep. But hey, of um, mouth for anyone that's... Did you say mouth, mouth tape? taping? I've been hearing yes. about this recently and I don't fully understand what are the benefits supposed to be of this? It's just, just literally pretty much taping your mouth shut while you sleep. Yes. Yeah. So um, mouth taping, um, I learned from Patrick McEwen. Um, mm -hmm. I done a chat with uh, Patrick a long time ago, but uh, when I struggled, when I was coming off drugs and I was, I say drugs, I was um, using them recreationally, but I was mm -hmm. also addicted to pharmaceuticals and benzos and diazepam and etc. And the withdrawal was, let's just say, not the nicest of times. Um, when I uh, struggled with my sleep, I checked in with Patrick McEwen, and he talks about the link between mental health and sleep and uh, mouth breathing. Hmm. Now, noses are for breathing, mouths are for eating. Now that we know that when our mouths are open whilst we sleep, people with sleep apnea, they live, uh, they don't live as long. They struggle with um, uh, metabolic diseases and they most of the time have brain fog and mental health issues. Now, sometimes what's happened is I had my um, nose damaged a few times from professional fighting. And what happened was I couldn't breathe through my nose properly. And when I broke, breathed through my nose, because I couldn't breathe through my nose, my mouth would open automatically to get as much oxygen into my body while I was sleeping. I can't control that when I sleep. So I would wear nose openers to make my nose open. Uh, this is really good for your love life, by the way. And, um, 
and wear mouth tape and blue blocking glasses and <laughs> earplugs. And uh, yeah, your uh, your partner's not exactly. Um, uh, she's like, what on earth are you doing? Uh, but um, and she's used to it now. She actually <laughs> does it herself a lot. Of it. Um, but mouth tape is a really big, important part to really making sure we're going to those deep stages of sleep. We need to breathe through our nose for nitric oxide production. Probably, I'd say, 80% of the world, um, that percentage might be off um, nowadays, but uh, are deficient in nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is what our body needs to be able to have CO2 released into the body for our brain health, for our body in general. And most of the time, people that struggle with um, uh, weight issues or with mental health issues, you look at their breathing patterns whilst they sleep and they'll be breathing through their mouth. Mm. Especially snorers, you know, get your tape, your tape, uh, your mouth taped up. And that doesn't mean you need to be able to mouth tape it fully. It's just a thin layer across the mouth. Oh, so you okay. Can breathe through, breathe through either side. So I just use some microspore tape. But I've done lots of content on that as well, yeah, you know, on regards to what type of tape and how to do it and stuff. So fascinating. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. Yeah, I'm hearing more and more about it. it, it that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, I know you talk about how, you know, the inner work we do impacts health. So naturally, there were a couple of questions that were related to this. So we had Vivian asked about uh, how to overcome feeling chronically stressed. You know, we know we have to keep our nervous system calm if we want to be healthy. So, yeah. Any, any thoughts on that? I would go with literally what you just said there, like is, is, is firstly, being aware that you're chronically stressed is, is, is part of the puzzle. Mm, yeah. um, you've already done that um, what was the lady's name uh, Vivian so Vivian yeah you've already done that work already by um, noticing that you are that you've got some chronically stressed and of course everything that's going on in the world everyone's going to be having all of these trauma responses at the moment um, fear and guilt is being bumped into the world so people are uh, um, in a trauma response of course a lot of the time and we are massively chronically um, stressed um, from it depends on where you live in the world. So how can we start to tone that down or to work with that is we have to start to regulate the nervous system in a way that is more healthy for us. How can we do that? Um, obviously, we want to try and get rid of the problem that's causing the stress. So that's not always easy. Say it's work or say it's uh, a family member that's in our lives. We can't just remove these things as easily as we can say uh, something else you know so um, looking at what those things are triggering you and why they are triggering you and what they make you feel like what's the emotion that's going on there and why you're being triggered to this stress response so let's say it's a work-related issue what is it about work that's making you overly stressed what is that is it someone at work speaking to you in a certain way is it a boundaries thing? Are you always saying yes to things when really you want to say no? Are you always doing things for other people all the time, feeling that that's what your responsibility, that you need to um, do everything for everyone else and your needs aren't being met? You know, finding out what those where the root cause of your stress is. Once you know the root cause of your stress, then we can start to look at how we can get down to that root cause and that emotion and what type of affirmations and mantras you can use to go, I'm safe, I feel okay right now, whatever that may be. And then you've got all the nervous system regulating um, activities and movements and things you can do to keep your body in a sort of calmed state and supplementation, of course, as well, to help your body laugh. Yeah, There's so many avenues I could go down. Yeah. <laughs> Vivian, yeah. if you was here, I would ask you myself and I would probably be able to really uh, delve in there with you. But it's so vast with how I work. you know. Oh, I think that was a really good explanation, though. And it you know, shows that it's it's like it sounds like like with most things, you have to come at it from a few different angles, looking at the source, looking at, you know, your interactions in the moment and so forth. So, yeah, no, thank mm -hmm. you for that. Yeah. We also had a question from Sergio. He's asking about how to keep yourself motivated during the dark times. So you're going through something incredibly challenging in your life. How do you keep yourself um, yeah, in the right mm. headspace? Mm. Yeah, thank you for that question. 
I want to think about that for a second. How do you keep yourself motivated through the dark times? I guess from my own personal experience of going through some very dark times was understanding and really believing and trusting them that they won't last. Mm. Uh, that impermanence is a thing and it will go and it will release and trust that and that you don't need to fix anything. You don't need to do anything right now, that it will work out and it is all working out for you right now and this is here to teach you something at that moment in time. That was how I got through some really dark times in my life was understanding, okay, what is this teaching me? What is this What is this uh, teaching me in regards to growth right now in my life? How can I really learn as much as I can from this? So staying motivated through those periods in regards to doing our day-to-day -day living, I would say just do what you can. If that be just get up in the morning, roll out of bed and try and take a shower. Do the things that are really going to make a big impact on your day, you know, like the hydration. And the, even if you roll onto the floor and just do a little bit of stretching or put some music on that makes you laugh for a brief second whilst you're going through a dark time. And being around friends and family that are uplifting for you. You know, so, I mean, that was only personally what I did. Yeah, no, that, that sounds that sounds really good and it, it makes tons of sense. I, I appreciate that. I think that's important and it's a powerful mindset to get in if you can get yourself there of learning from things and viewing it as a learning opportunity, which I know can feel like a tough pill to swallow when things are really, really mm -hmm. tough. Um, but it can be powerful. And yeah, and finding ways to hold on to that hope. That's my number one goal with this channel is just... Of course, to put hopefully helpful resources and information out there, but uh, above all else, just just to put out hope. So when people are stuck in those times, they can you know hopefully see something that from someone and get some inspiration or some hope to to yeah to keep going. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm, uh, completely, and I will say that your channel was the one that really helped me in regards to what you said about exercise and movement, and how training helped you through chronic fatigue. And you, I believe you put a routine up. Is that right? I did. Uh, <laughs> a very you know, embarrassing I, sort of exercise video, yes. <laughs> no, no, not all. It's amazing. And I think what I took from that was learning about baselines and baselines and where you mm. are in your fatigue journey. And um, being able to, it just made sense from a logical perspective that, you know, wherever your baseline is, is that you don't need to push it. I will never go back to training the way that I used to train, ever. Because it wasn't good for my body. So I took so much from that in regards to what you said. Um, yeah, okay. What else do we have on us here? Um, oh, Katie asked, how to find balance? Oh, yeah, this is a big one. Between accepting your illness and focusing on self-care and how she put it is ignoring it to have fun. Mmm. Mmm. That's a big question. Um, it is. Yeah. Uh, I guess. I know it sounds uh, really uh, an easy answer, but it is about understanding yourself before anyone else tells you about finding balance, is knowing mm. what your body needs. So, for example, you need to have fun. You need to enjoy yourself. You need to be able to go and do things. But also are those things going to be serving your higher good? where you're wanting to really be in your life if in two years time you want to be completely healthy you want to feel good you want to be running again you want to be eating good food you want to be more present in your day whatever those goals are for you that you really want to aspire to be i sometimes ask myself is this going to help me get there sometimes the answer is yes sometimes i do want to go out with uh, friends and family and eat food and and go to a comedy and have a drink or whatever you know not that I drink alcohol anymore, but um, I have like alcohol-free beer and just whatever makes me uh, feel like I'm part of the party in some way or another. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's, um, it's really trying to find that balance for you and not trying to uh, push yourself to do things that you don't want to do or then definitely doing things that aren't going to be serving you that good Um and using it as an excuse to escape from the pain that you're in right now or the struggle that you're having right now.
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I don't know if you found something similar, but for me in my journey, the things that were fun to me morphed over time and they became more and more in line with the things that served my health. You know, it became more mm. one and the same. There wasn't such a big gap. You know, it wasn't like, okay, I need to eat a massive pizza and drink an entire bottle of wine. And that's my idea of fun. I mean, I still have those moments, but <laughs> over time I found I've got more joy out of things that were healthier. So it didn't feel like work. It wasn't like switching from like, ooh, a horrible, unpleasant self-care into, you know, when do I get to do this stuff that's really fun? Some of those things start Completely. to Completely. Become- I, I resonate with everything you said then. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I do think that's a part of the journey for you. Like the things that you enjoy. I, if I, my past self, um, I would told him that he would have enjoyment in stretching and being grounded and just going for a <laughs> walk and meditating. I would have laughed. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think it's a process that you start to learn and enjoy those things that you don't need to go out and get drunk every weekend or eat loads yeah. of bad food that has got. You know, foods that's not so, so not helping you all the time. You know? Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important. Well, I could keep you here all day, but I think a good place to kind of wrap up was would just be to hear, you know, just a little bit more, if you don't mind sharing about some of the work that you do. If people want to learn more, where can they reach you? What, you know, what sort of support do you offer yeah, and so forth? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty much most active on Instagram um, most of the time. I try and post everything up there and be really vulnerable with my journey and a lot of the stuff that people see in my stories and my posts are things I'm currently studying or learning. As I said, I'm currently studying psychotherapy at the moment, trauma informed. And a lot of the stuff that comes up then is, is around that at the moment. And also some of the health stuff uh, that I I put up here and there. So yeah, come and connect with me on Instagram. Um, Tell me how you connected with me and uh, yeah. Um, have a look through some of my highlights. There's some really old ones on there about mouth taping, blue blocking glasses, night routines, morning routines, why I do this in my morning. I go pretty much in detail with a lot of those things. In regards to how I help uh, clients, I do I work one-to-one with people in clinic. I work with people over three months all the way up to two years, depending on what's going on for them. Uh, I have a sort of different programs. I do a gut reset program where it's just focusing on resetting the gut, and getting more than a microbiome sort of flourishing and diverse and correcting some of those um, toxic habits that we may have had later in our, earlier in our life. And I also do something called the work, which is a three to six month period where we work on the physical health for the first four weeks, routines, biohacking, health hacking, gut health, nutrition, movement, hydration, making sure all of those are optimal and also sleep. And then in the next four weeks, we go into something um, which is more inner work, shadow-based, trauma, the emotional release stuff, trauma release exercises. And then the last stage is about integrating all of those into our habits of our daily life and working with those. So yeah, that's uh, generally sort of the main sort of stuff that I do. Wow, incredible. Um, Is that available locally in Australia or is some of this available for international people as well? So, yeah, it's all online. Um, Oh, okay. Most of my clients are, uh, I'd say 60% of my clients are in America. I've got people all all over the world, so it's international. Okay. I do it all online, so it's all through Zoom, but I work one-to-one. I don't do group stuff with people because I feel that we need to really connect on a one-to-one basis over a period of time to really get to the root causes of things and find out what's going on with that person. This is so amazing. I really, truly feel, Ryan, that you are such a gift to people out there who are, you know, working through whatever they're working through. I just, I'm so, so grateful for your time here today. I can't thank you enough for going through all of this. This has just been so insightful and so packed full of great information. I just, yes. From my heart, thank you so much, Ryan, for doing this today. Mm, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you just letting me come on board and doing this and chatting. And sorry if I waffle on with things. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can go on and on about certain things for a long period of time. So I appreciate everyone for tuning in and listening as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank oh, you. not at all. Every word I think was was really valuable and really helpful. So thank you. So yeah, as always, people watching, um, thank you 
for watching. Uh, whatever you're going through, you know, hang in there, keep going, just one baby step at a time. Um, keep searching. Good for you for watching this video and trying to find answers and trying to get support. And if you have questions for Ryan or myself, please put them in the comments and I'm sure we'd both be happy to answer them there as well. So yeah, that's it. Thank you again, Ryan. Thank you to everyone who is watching and I hope to see you in the next video.